do you respect the group identity or do you respect people as individuals? The moment that you shade over into that belief that it's the group that you're respecting, that's when identity politics begins to really seriously conflict with some basic principles of a liberal society. Hello, welcome to Ezra Klein Show on the Vox Media Podcast Network. My guest this week is Francis Fukuyama. Uh, he's very well known for the, the broad end of history hypothesis and book and article, but he just wrote a new book called Identity, which is all about identity and the modern conception of identity and how that feeds into identity politics and whether all of that is threatening the stability of modern liberal democracies. This is a question and a conversation about one of my favorite topics, which is whether or not all politics is actually identity politics. As always, you can email me at Ezra Klein Show at box.com. Again, Ezra Klein Show at box.com. But without further ado, here is Francis Fukuyama. Francis Fukuyama, welcome back to the podcast. Oh, thank you very much. So I didn't realize that Donald Trump had a bit part in your first book, The End of History and the Last Man. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Uh, sure. So the, the last part of that book, most people never got around to reading. This was the part about the last man in which I put forward all of the threats to democracy that I saw uh, back in 1991 when the book was published. And I said, you know, one of the obvious threats are people of tremendous ambition that in a democracy uh, could really destabilize the system. That's why we have a system of checks and balances to keep these would-be Julius Caesars from overthrowing the republic. But the argument I made back then was that a market economy is also a good buffer because it gives tremendously ambitious people an alternative way uh, of making their mark in a way that's productive socially and doesn't affect the uh, political system. And I said, Donald Trump is an example of this. He's gone off, you know, as a real estate tycoon, and uh, it kind of neutralizes him. So little did I know 25 years later that it wouldn't be <laughs> enough for him. I mean, he actually failed at the entrepreneurship side. He went bankrupt and then went on to be a reality TV star. But now we're still stuck with him. And so that, that buffer didn't work very well. So there was something super interesting in that section when I went back to look at it, which you wrote the excesses of freedom. And, and this is where you mentioned the arrogant display of a Donald Trump are much more visible than the evils of extreme equality, like creeping mediocrity or the tyranny of the majority. And it made me wonder if you think that part of why American – well, one of the American political parties came to embrace Donald Trump – is it became over time much more afraid of too much equality mm -hmm. than of too much freedom. Well, that's uh, that's definitely true. I think that you know that there's a racial component to this. Uh, you know that clearly we, for the first time, had a black president, and we you know people were saying we're in a post-racial society. That obviously bothered people. I think that the other element that's directly related to the identity themes uh, in, in my new book have to do with these demands for respect and dignity that are the basis of, you know, what we call political correctness uh, because what political correctness is is really regulating language in a way not to give offense to the dignity of, you know, particular groups. And I think that culturally this played out very badly for a lot of Americans who heard this and felt that this was a kind of excessive, you know, deference to uh, a kind of uh, equal dignity for everyone. And that's part of what made Donald Trump popular as a candidate because he wasn't politically correct. I mean, he was absolutely brilliant with Twitter because the way he uses Twitter, he can play the ethics of authenticity. People think, yeah, this is what he really thinks. And they, you know, even if they disagree with specific things he says, they like the fact that he's the only politician out there that really says what's on his mind. Well, I often think within the political correctness debate, there is the political correctness debate that elites imagine we're having, mm -hmm. which is much more on the margins of, of discussions mm -hmm. and social change. And then the political correctness debate as it actually exists in the country mm -hmm. and where Donald Trump is, where you get a lot of things where – People who do political punditry profession will get upset about something happening on a college campus. Mm -hmm. But what Donald Trump and people who support him want to be able to say is immigrants are bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and most of the people in that elite level mm -hmm. political correctness debate don't want to say immigrants are bad. Mm -hmm. They think that is actually – you shouldn't be saying they're rapists and murderers yeah. and when Mexico sends them, it's sending their best. 
there's a lot of innovation to Donald Trump, but there's also a kind of catching a wave. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that that passage had made me think about was if I had read that back in the day when you said that the evils of extreme equality are creeping mediocrity or the tyranny of the majority, I would have probably said, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But what it actually seems to me people don't like about that much equality, what's creating some of the people in our system now is not the tyranny of the majority, but the rise of minorities. Mm -hmm. That it's actually the majority feeling it is losing some power, which is mm -hmm. something you talk mm -hmm. about in, in the new book. Mm -hmm. That is the destabilizing emotion. Well, I think the the way that this has played out in American society, you know, you had these very important uh, social movements that began in the 1960s for African American equality, the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, the LGBT movement. Uh, all of these things were basically uh, demands for respect uh, and inclusion in American society. And they had a power dimension because you can't get that equality without, you know, taking power. Uh, and so that's been happening over the last, you know, 30, 40 years. And I think that's right that it has generated this uh, backlash that uh, people, you know, are uncomfortable with that situation and uncomfortable with the particular ways that it's played out especially in the culture, in the popular culture. This is something I think that your, your book does really well. You have a line in here that I'd like you to talk a little bit about, which is much of what passes for economic motivation is, I will argue, actually rooted in the demand for recognition and therefore cannot simply be satisfied by economic means. Mm -hmm. Could you unpack that? Well, there's a really nice line in Adam Smith's uh, book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, where he says, he first of all says, you know, there's not a lot of abject poverty in the Scotland of the late 18th century that he lived in, he says the rich man glories in his riches and the poor man is invisible to his fellow human beings. And that's really about recognition. What he's saying is that the rich man actually doesn't want the next, you know, increment of wealth. What he wants is people to look at him and say, yes, he's a really great, you know, superior human being. And the pain of being poor of course, it's the lack of resources, but it's also the fact that nobody looks you in the eye. People don't regard you as a fellow human being. Uh, I made a reference to Ralph Ellison's famous book, Invisible Man, where he talks about a black man moving to Harlem, where there isn't the kind of overt segregation and racism that there is in the South. What there is is that invisibility, that blacks are just not seen by white people. And that's really the pain of racism. And that's really about recognition. It's not about so much you know, the equal division of resources or jobs or that sort of thing. Right. I think this is such an interesting point. I want to hold here for a, a couple of minutes, which is we think of money as a good that buys things, but it's also mm -hmm. a positional good. It is. It is. One of my favorite stories here, uh, Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. when he came back as CEO of Apple, for a number of years, he only took a dollar of salary. Right. And then the board for years was saying, you know, we, we have to pay you. You're making Apple successful again. We have to pay you. And he said, no, no I'm, I'm taking a dollar. And then eventually he was like, okay, you can pay me. And then he demanded a compensation package so big <laughs> that the board began to quake. Mm -hmm. And it was because there was dignity in coming back and saving Apple for a dollar. And there was dignity in being the highest paid CEO around. Mm -hmm. But it was undignified, even though it was clearly more money, mm -hmm. to just be paid at a normal level for a successful tech CEO. Right. And I think that stuff is really important. It's not just – it doesn't just happen among the rich. It's it, What's the old line that a man is rich when he is richer than his brother-in-law? It's That's something right. like that? That's right. Well, the economist Robert Frank has a, a book called uh, Looking for the Right Pond, and it's really about the fact that a lot of this quest for economic resources is actually positional. And he's got these examples like, you know, you can buy a $40,000 barbecue. Why does anyone in the world need to pay that much money for a barbecue? Well, it's because you're comparing yourself to your neighbor who only has a, you know, $1,000 barbecue. And so it's that status, you know, that's really important. And he has a lot of interesting data that people at the top of the economic distribution and the bottom between, let's say, Nigeria and Germany – they're equally happy if they're at the top and they're equally unhappy if they're at the bottom, even though the absolute levels of wealth are obviously tremendously different between the two countries because people are really comparing themselves to their neighbors and not against some absolute standard of uh, material happiness. I think there can be a tendency to hear this, to hear money talked about as a positional good and think, OK, then that's fake. 
if you want mm-hmm. money to buy things, that's real. That's your your real economic anxiety talking. Mm-hmm. But if you want money to seem better off than your neighbor or or to be looked at, you know, with uh, respect in your community, that's fake. And, and I also think that actually undermines this conversation quite a bit because after very basic food, shelter, health issues. Um, a lot of what we're buying is not "quote unquote" necessary. Mm-hmm. I mean, we we live uh, a very materialistically rich life. Even those even those of us who are not doing that well in mm-hmm. modern America, compared to what people were at two hundred years ago when there mm-hmm. were no antibiotics, and status is very real. Mm-hmm. There's just almost nothing people want more than status. That's right. And, and, and so I do think there's a way in which when people hear you say maybe the economic anxiety issue is actually a positional anxiety issue. That what they hear you saying is it's fake mm-hmm. or it's not respectable. It's not real. But but it is real. In some it ways, it's real. probably more real. Well, so, you know, my my discussion of this starts with this uh, Greek word thumos that Plato talks about. I'm as, glad you pronounced that before I had to. Yeah, okay. Because <laughs> that, that is not, how, not where I was going to go with yeah. that. <laughs> so thumos is this part of the soul. It's a third part of the soul. So Socrates says there's a desiring part. There's the rational part. But isn't there this third part that basically wants respect? And it gets angry when it doesn't get respect. Uh, And isn't that a completely separate driver? And I think that that's the important insight with which this discussion of dignity starts, that we all feel that we have this inner dignity and we want other people to acknowledge it. And it is, you know, really about that acknowledgement and it's not about the material side of things and it can run at cross purposes. And so people will sacrifice material goods and, and resources in order to get that respect. So something you say in the book is that it is intuitive that social revolution and upheaval would come from the poorest in society. They're they're the ones who Mm -hmm. have the most reason to be upset. But you you talk about uh, something Alexis de Tocqueville wrote about, that Mm -hmm. in the French Revolution, it came from the middle class. And it often comes from the middle class. Why then does it often come from the middle class? Well, again, it's it's because of this relative status issue that – uh, well, in the first place, very poor people are too worried about getting food on the table. They don't organize well. They're very hard to turn into a political movement except under really, really desperate circumstances. On the other hand, if you're a middle-class person who's lost status or fears that they're gonna, you're going to lose status, that puts you in this frenzy of anger and resentment because you think, you know, I used to represent the national identity of my country. I'm the kind of person that's the bread and butter of you know, citizenship. And then all of a sudden, uh, all, these, all these other people are moving ahead of me. And that's the point at which you get revolutions. Uh, the French Revolution, Tocqueville said, was indeed, as you said, you know, created by these middle class people who hoped for reform but then were disappointed and angry that it didn't materialize. To me, this is very helpful in thinking through the post-election debate we've had, Mm -hmm. which is, was it economic anxiety powering Donald Trump or racial and and social resentment? And the way a lot of people tried to synthesize that debate was that economic deprivation, economic anxiety activated racial resentment, Mm -hmm. activated status concerns, Mm -hmm. and that there's – Another argument, which in another book with identity in the title, Identity Crisis, which mm-hmm. is by, by three political scientists and coming out next month, and, and it's terrific. They show, I think, as you theorize here, that what happened was status concerns activated a lot of economic anxiety, that the mm-hmm. people who were most pessimistic about the economy were the most racially resentful. And then after the election, the most racially resentful became the most economically optimistic. Mm-hmm. And so to me, there's a way of pulling all this together that ends up making a lot of sense. And and, and similarly, Donald Trump was not powered by the poorest of the poor. No, that's right. He was a middle-class candidate. Actually, the poorest of the poor voted for Hillary Clinton. Right. Yeah. No, I think uh, it's it's important in understanding the Trump vote is it's the either people that were middle class and had lost some of that status through deindustrialization or it's people that were middle class and perfectly secure but imagined a future in which they might be vulnerable to this. That explains also a lot of things that are going on in Europe. So in southern Europe, you have this traditional left-wing populism, Podemos in Spain or Syriza in Greece, which is really the bottom layer of society just wanting more redistribution. In northern Europe, the people who vote for the populists are actually working or lower middle class people, not the poorest stratum in the society. Those are actually the immigrants and, you know, new arrivals and so forth. But It's these people that thought of themselves as middle class and now feel threatened in their economic status and in their social status. And and that's where the populist vote really comes from. 
All right. I think this is a good groundwork we've laid, these ways in which economic interests and status interests and identity are intermingled to, to get into, mm-hmm. I think, the core critique of your book. Let's begin with what the modern notion of identity is. You, okay. you, you define what identity politics is premised on as having three parts. What are they? Well, so the first part is this thumos. It's this universal psychological characteristic that all of us want, respect, and particularly, you know, we, we feel resentful when we don't get equal respect to other people in the society. The second is this notion of an inside and an outside that begins to develop in European thought, you know, in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, that we have an authentic self buried deeply inside us. And there's a surrounding society that does not give it adequate recognition. But what makes the modern version of this different is that the problem is not to bring that individual into compliance with society's rules. The problem becomes how do you change the society? The society is wrong. The inner self is right. And how do I get the society to change its mores to recognize that inner self? And then the final issue is the shifting nature of dignity, which I think in the Western tradition uh, has to do with moral agency, that we believe that people are capable of making free moral choices and that's the basis for giving them political rights. That's the reason on which the Declaration of Independence could say all men are created equal. They're obviously not equal in so many different respects, but in the respect that we are moral agents, we do have a claim to a share of political power and therefore to political equality. It's so it's the combination of those three, I think, that constitutes the modern sense of identity. So I was trying to think through what this definition of identity implied. And, and I, I think it implies that there is a, a point in history previous to these three components coming together in which you don't have what we would think of as identity politics. Mm-hmm. Is that is that yeah, true? I think that's right. I think that in you know, every society has got people that are discontented and they say, you know, I'm not understood and, you know, I hate the social rules that I'm forced to comply with. But I think up until the modern period, basically everybody's opinion would be, yeah, well, that's tough. You know, you've got to – And what is the modern period? And the modern period – well, you know, I actually argue it in a sense it begins with the Protestant Reformation because in the 16th century because what Martin Luther said – is that the authentic Christian is the one who believes on the inside and the entire outside world, the Catholic Church that sets all the social rules, that's what's wrong and it's that outside world that's got to be destroyed in favor of the inner believer. And that's the first moment at which you get somebody asserting that that true self, that inner self is the authentic and morally valid one. You know, it sets the grounds really for a revolutionary situation where you say, actually, yeah, we have to smash that entire external social structure. And I think many of our social revolutions were based on that, that actually it's the society that's wrong and it's that inner self, whether it's not recognizing somebody that's racially different, not recognizing someone who's female, uh, you know, with different sexual orientations. All of these are not saying, no, no. You individual have to conform to our rules. It's saying, no, no, this whole society needs to go through a cultural revolution in which we recognize the dignity of those inner selves. Here's a question this raises for me. Is what we didn't have before the the Protestant Reformation, was it identity or was it not having politics? Because I, I'm nowhere mm-hmm. near as learned on, on past political history as you are, but using religious identity as, mm-hmm. as one option here. There are a lot of religious wars before then, mm-hmm. but there was a lot less of what I think we think of today as politics. I mean, there was some, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you have Greece and Athens and, you know, there, there's plenty going on. But the ability of groups to come forward as claimants mm-hmm. and, and ask for recognition and, and put something on the agenda, there are many fewer societies that function that way. And yet there are clearly a lot of identities that emerge mm-hmm. and in a bid for recognition, certainly the way we think – the way the history gets glossed today, yeah. there's war. I mean, if politics mm-hmm. is is war by is what what is the old line you would know better than me? Politics is uh, war is politics by other. That's means. what I'm looking yeah, for. And if war is politics by other means, mm-hmm. then aren't those religious wars of that period identity politics in a pre-modern political era? Well, yeah. So you certainly did have different religious, you know, beliefs, and and they they were in conflict. But I think. For example, you know, the, the first real big manifestation of the modern concept of identity politics is nationalism. And that has a very specific modern connotation. So politics 
previously in virtually all parts of the world was dynastic. It was built around families and their right to rule because they were conquerors. And in the 18th, 19th century, you get this idea that no, actually that's not the proper organization for a modern political order, that you have these cultural groups that are usually defined by language. They're spread across a lot of different dynastic jurisdictions. And what we want to get adequate recognition is that they should have their own country with a border that contains all of the French speakers or all of the German speakers. And that's really something new because that then reorders the political map of Europe if all of a sudden politics has to conform to culture rather than, you know, to simply whose grandfather conquered your province, you know, a hundred years ago. I'm very glad you brought up nationalistic identity here because here's where I'm going to put myself in the role of critic. Convince me that all politics is not identity politics. <laughs> well, a lot of politics is identity politics. You know, the philosopher Hegel in his philosophy of history basically said A huge that, social justice warrior. Yeah. He's no. <laughs> a, <laughs> no, but, but he said that actually, you know, most uh, politics is driven by what he called the struggle for recognition. So he actually put this identity issue at, at the forefront. I mean, he said that it's a war between masters and slaves and then the modern solution is to provide everybody with equal and universal recognition. And so there is a, a sense in which that argument has been put forth. But I do think that there are real differences between, for example, the politics that's emerging now in the second decade of the 21st century and the typical politics of the 20th century. So the politics of the 20th century was built around ideology. It was built around these policy differences about the role of the state, how intrusive the state should be, what kind of social institutions you know, should exist. And that's different from an identity-based politics in which you have these fixed identity groups that are competing and asserting those identities uh, against one another. And I think that, you know, actually democratic politics works less well. You're correct that, you know, there are certain parts of the world in which uh, politics has always been identity-based. So that's really the problem in the Middle East right now. Uh, you have um, out-of-control identity politics based on sect ethnicity, region, tribal uh, groups uh, in Libya, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan. I mean, that's really the problem in these countries is that uh, it's all identity-based, you know, conflicts between, between these groups that feel that the political boundaries don't correspond to, you know, their need for recognition. But in a developed democracy, you know, things are not supposed to work that way. We're supposed to argue over policies and over ideas and, and that sort of thing. Today's episode of The Ezra Klein Show is sponsored by Pipeline, a new play coming to movie theaters this October for a limited engagement. Lincoln Center Theater's acclaimed staging depicts a mother's hopes for her son and their family's clash with an educational system rigged against it. It was hailed as potent and intensely acted by The New York Times and lauded as a riveting and powerful new drama by NY1. Tickets are available now for October 3, 5, and 7 in select theaters nationwide. For tickets and more information, visit pipelineincinema.com. That's P-I-P-E-L-I-N-E in cinema.com. Again, pipeline in cinema.com. So I, I want to lay my model out on the table a bit so you're able to mm -hmm. kind of critique it back because here's what seems to me to be going on in a lot of these conversations that – Virtually all politics is on some of identity politics, uh, and, and I'll use the nationalism mm -hmm. example here. We are constantly in America engaging in politics based on our identity as Americans, mm -hmm. right? That is why if you live on one side of mm -hmm. the U.S.-Mexico border, you get one set of social benefits, and mm -hmm. if you live on the other side, you get another, right? The, it's not a it's not a genetic difference, right? It's a, we we've constructed mm -hmm. an identity, built it around borders and, mm -hmm. and and we're Americans. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. um, when I say all politics is identity politics, I'm saying that I don't think that's as bad a thing as others do. But that what appears to me to be happening is that over a certain threshold of power or size, um, so when you're talking about America mm -hmm. or you're talking about white people or you're talking about the working class, mm -hmm. if you have enough people and they have enough power – it ceases to look like identity politics. Mm -hmm. It just looks like politics. Yeah. Where then when it's uh, a group that has less power, African-Americans, um, LGBT individuals, mm -hmm. uh, whoever, 
then we look at that and we say, that over there is identity politics. And my model for what's been going on mm-hmm. is you had a lot of that in 20th century with the civil rights movement, we had the feminist yeah. movement, mm-hmm. we had you know all kinds of different things. And a lot of, within the economic mm-hmm. debates, a lot of identity, I mean, there's been a lot of efforts to self-consciously construct identities of working class, mm-hmm. of proletariat, of union member. In the 21st century, for reasons of demographic change, technology changing, all kinds of different things, equ- political equality and political mm-hmm. rights, voting, more groups that were smaller have mm-hmm. become powerful enough to put their arguments yeah, onto the right. agenda. So we see more identity politics that we were suppressing before, but not because there was less identity politics, mm-hmm. but because the majority identities had more of a hammerlock on politics. No, that's right. So, so, so yeah, no, no, is that so wrong? This is, or? No, no, I, I agree completely. Oh, so, great. Podcast <laughs> I, over. <laughs> no, I, I, identity is inherently flexible. It's socially constructed. So it can be either large or it can be small. And so what is usually referred to as identity politics in the context of the United States is not that broad sense of national identity. I mean, we've been arguing about that for 250 years. I mean, that's a separate argument. What we identify as identity politics is actually the assertions of these marginalized groups for special recognition of their particular identities in the particular ways that they have been marginalized. And that is a social justice issue that is perfectly legitimate because they were marginalized, they were disregarded, their interests were not taken into account by that larger uh, kind of national level identity. So yeah, you're, you're right that it's identity on both levels. I say at the end of the book, we're never going to get away from identity. It's too much embedded in the way we think about ourselves. But we have to think about whether we want the broad identities or the narrow ones. And I don't have a problem with people wanting to uh, defend these disrespected identities. I think you have a problem when they become excessively attached to fixed characteristics like race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, you know, uh, these sorts of things. And I think that they become uh, problematic when they're not balanced by a concern for the larger integrative identity which is also, I think, really necessary to have a democratic community because if you don't have a larger uh, sense of identity where you share belief in the legitimacy of your democratic institutions, where you're not able to deliberate or discuss or you know, communicate with other people, then your democratic polity is not going to work so well. So it's not a question of you know, saying those little identities, those particularistic identities are bad because you know, they, people are – discriminated against in these very specific ways. But you also need to have a concern for the existence of this larger common shared space where you know lived experiences of specific groups can actually evolve into something like a shared experience that, that the whole society feels. So I think that's super interesting. One of the things that I find frustrating in the entire identity politics conversation is its emphasis on singular identities, Mm -hmm. as if people have one identity. Mm -hmm. When often it seems to me that what identity politics is, is the way different identities are interacting simultaneously. And and in a lot of ways, I I will say, I think the left is more sophisticated on this. Intersectionality is an idea about Mm -hmm. how identities interact together. But I mean, I think you look at the history of things like the civil rights movement, and there was a lot of power that got from people who went to war on behalf of the United States had an identity as Americans, Mm -hmm. as soldiers, as people Mm -hmm. who'd been willing to lay down their lives for their country. That's right. Then they come back and they're treated as second-class African-American citizens. Mm -hmm. And the disconnect, the friction between those identities creates an an energy that gets used. And so I think where I get off the train a little bit is the idea that the folks coming from, to to use your term, more particularistic identities are using a less broad definition – it seems to me that what they're asking for is something different, a redistribution, and that that is friction. And, mm-hmm. and people don't like mm-hmm. to see friction in their political system. They, they prefer or, or they feel like they prefer a kind of quiet, particularly when the quiet is benefiting them. But the identity of somebody who has been oppressed but believes themselves is an American mm-hmm. and, and believes entitled to their share of, of the American mm-hmm. dream and somebody who believes they're an American and everything's fine and they wish people would stop yelling at them mm-hmm. – to give one the the moniker of broad identity and one the moniker of narrow identity, it feels like what's really different is whether they want to change in the status quo or not. Mm-hmm. No, that's right, and I think it's perfectly legitimate for the more marginalized you know identities to make that assertion. So there's a very sort of nuanced point I think where that potentially goes off the rails, where the 
emphasis is no longer on actually me as a marginalized person wanting to share in that common identity. That was Martin Luther King and the original civil rights movement uh, to evolving to a point where you say, well, actually, I'm, I am different and I want recognition of that difference of me as a member of a particular group. As the black power movement began to evolve, you got a different view, you know, not that we're simply trying to share in that same American dream, but we actually have a, a kind of different dream. So that's one point. And then I guess the thing that becomes the most problematic is where it sort of joins hands with the old kind of biological understanding of identity, where you're mistreated on the grounds of a fixed characteristic like race, gender, you know, sexual orientation and so forth. And you kind of internalize that and say, yeah, so anybody in that category, you know, necessarily shares the same experience and therefore should think the same in terms of political views, in terms of attitudes towards culture and the like. Uh, and that, you know, is a kind of recognition of groups as opposed to a recognition of individuals. And I think in a democratic society that – or a liberal democratic society, that becomes problematic. I'll, I'll give you a – you know, more extreme example that is much more common in Europe than in the United States. Uh, you have a view of multiculturalism that says, yeah, actually what a modern pluralistic society is, is a pluralism of groups, not of individuals, but of groups. One of those groups, you know, are Muslim immigrants who force their daughters to go back to Morocco or Pakistan or wherever the family came from and marry the, you know, the husband that the family picks for them. They're anti-Semitic, you know, because of the Arab-Israeli conflict. They don't like uh, homosexuals and they are intolerant in a whole number of ways that really conflict with the liberal view uh, that as individuals we should be treated as autonomous agents. And it involves a real conflict of principle there. Do you respect the group identity and the group culture or do you respect people as individuals? And I think that the moment that you shade over into that belief that it's the group that you're respecting, that's also, I think, when identity politics begins to really seriously conflict with some basic principles of a liberal society. Where do you see tensions like that in the American identity politics? Well, I don't think that it plays out in a lot of real-world politics. It plays out in university campuses. It plays out in the arts you know, you have this big argument over cultural appropriation where, you know, you begin to say that certain cultural groups have exclusive rights to certain, you know, cultural themes or memes or, you know, products. You see that in a certain intolerance of questioning a certain – well, and, and I think a kind of, in my view, an excessive uh, concern with, you know, with group dignity. Uh, which is really what drives a lot of the conversation in in spaces like this. Now, I will be the first to say I don't think this is a general condition in the United States. I think this is actually still fairly rarefied. And unfortunately, we've gotten to the point in our politics where uh, conservatives love to then pick up on specific incidents of this and say, look at this outrageous thing that happened you know, in Middlebury College or at Yale and so forth. And they say, well, there's no freedom of speech left in – the academy, and I think you know that they're exploiting for their own purposes. And I don't think empirically, you know, we're at that point yet. But there's enough of it. You know, there's enough of it that it's it's troubling, and it does conflict with other kinds of liberal values. I think that we, you know, that we espouse. So let me ask a question about this because I'm I'm actually pretty sympathetic to it. But one of the questions I have about it is how different it really is. Mm -hmm. So take the Christian identity that has existed since the dawn of, of this country and has always been and continues to be very powerful. So I'm Jewish. And so I um, am often on the outside of that looking in. And mm -hmm. I grew up, you know, in Christmas plays at, at school. And, you know, I see every U.S. president swear their oath to the Constitution and to the country on a Bible. Mm -hmm. And there, there seem to me to be a lot of assertions of Christian group dignity, Right, how important it has been to this country. I mean, if you listen to to Christian right politics just mm -hmm. for even a minute, you know, there's a lot about this being a, a Christian country and, mm -hmm. and how integral that has been to to our success. And I'm not actually saying I think that's a bad thing necessarily. I, I understand it. I understand the, the the desire for that kind of group dignity. But what it makes me wonder about is how much what we are dealing with is the confusion of having other groups demand 
what feels to them like the same, mm-hmm. right? You know, when you when you talk about some of these groups, um, certainly in America, who are coming on saying, hey, you actually need to give us some respect for what we have contributed here, mm-hmm. that there are certain things that are ours and are our contribution. Mm-hmm. I think that people look at that and say, wait, no, actually, like that's not how we do things in America. And they look and they say, no, that's exactly how you do things in America. Mm-hmm. It is so how you do things in America that you've stopped seeing it. Mm-hmm. And that's a bit of my question. That there's a real difference between the situation we're in being one where there is a rise of a new kind of politics versus because of demographic change, because of um, redistributions of power in society, new groups being able to lay claim to an old kind of politics mm-hmm. and an old kind of assertion of dignity. Mm-hmm. And that just creates instability in society. Mm-hmm. I think it really depends on how far those claims go. So I think nobody would object to a certain kind of treasuring of ethnic inheritance, of religious traditions. Uh, I think that in a way, uh, religious liberty in the United States has always meant that, that there is a big protected private sphere in which you can make those assertions. So where it becomes controversial is in the public sphere about, you know, what kind of displays do you put on at Christmas time in a public building or you know can you put the 10 commandments up in a courthouse you know this sort of thing and actually i think that in the public sphere we've moved a huge distance uh, towards that accommodation with the fact that actually we do have multiple religious you know cultural ethnic uh, kinds of traditions uh, i was really struck by this uh, you know every i'm i'm here in washington uh, every year with a group of my Stanford students. And one of the things we do is we go to the Lincoln Memorial late at night and read the Gettysburg Address and the second inaugural. And if you read the second inaugural particularly, you're just struck right from the beginning how religious uh, the language is. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, he quotes the 19th Psalm, Lincoln quotes the 19th Psalm, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether in justifying the bloodshed of of the Civil War. And it's a remarkable uh, piece of rhetoric because I don't think that a modern politician could give a speech like that. It is highly steeped in this very, very vivid biblical uh, imagery. And I think that anyone that tried to use that kind of language today, you know, would immediately run into this buzzsaw of criticism that, you know, what about atheists? What about people that don't believe in the Bible? You know, this sort of thing. So actually, I do think that that accommodation has been made already and, you know, you're right that there is this sort of nostalgia on, on the part of people, on the, especially on the Christian right, that say, well, you know, nobody like Lincoln could give a speech like that anymore. Uh, I think, you know, frankly, that's an accommodation that has to be made with the fact that we are living in a, you know, a very culturally diverse society. So the question is then knowing where to draw the line against certain cultural practices that aren't simply an expression of this uh, important inner group identity uh, and where it begins to veer off into a real attack on more fundamental uh, liberal principles. Uh, That's really, I think, the issue involved. It's a super interesting question. I actually hadn't thought about it until you brought it up this way. I'm trying to think back through George W. Bush and Barack Obama's rhetoric because my sense of it is that Quoting from Psalms was a a huge mainstay for both of them and particularly with George W. Bush, I remember a lot of liberal criticism of it Mm -hmm. and a feeling that the Christian right was taking over the country. And then with Obama because – and this I think goes back to a lot of identity politics being the way different identities interact. While he was a Christian, he didn't have other markers of – I, I think what you might call like white Protestant Christian America, both you know going from skin color to actual it's his politics. And so it didn't code the same way. And I was thinking about it because it's interesting. Donald Trump, and I hadn't put it together until you said this, he never gives speeches like that. No, he never right. – I mean he does not give very Lincoln-esque yeah. speeches on any level. But he never gives speeches that are – He barely gives speeches He in barely English. gives speeches. <laughs> when he is doing it, when it is not that somebody's written a speech for the prayer, prayer breakfast mm-hmm. for him. I don't want to say he's never quoted a psalm. He does not have a tendency to fall back on Christian or religious rhetoric and yet – it's very clear that personally he is not a devout Christian. I yes, remember him uh, saying that he does not ask God for forgiveness and yet he got 87% yeah. of the evangelical white vote. I've seen him say things like, you know, when I'm in office, Christian America will be defended like it has never been defended before. It's very interesting to me the way he has managed to be part of 
the Christian political identity mm -hmm. without, I would say, being deeply or authentically part of the Christian religious identity. I don't think that he actually is part of any kind of religious identity. I think that the Christian right is being completely cynical and instrumental in this, that they care about, uh, you know, abortion and who's going to be on the Supreme Court and other decisions that will be made by the government that affect their interests. And they see him completely as a instrument for that. They may also like other things culturally. They may like his attack on political correctness. For all I know, they may like his tax policies. But I, I don't think that they truly believe that he's one of them because he's so obviously, you know, a kind of despicable individual in terms of the kinds of morality that is, is expected of a Christian that it's, you know, I think that contradiction is still there for them as well. But I do wonder just how much that that's insight into the way a lot of identity politics and related operation works, which is that the identity has a container, right? There, mm -hmm. there, there are things we build the identity on. We're Americans or we live in a rural area or we're Christians or we're Jewish or, um, you know, we're liberals, whatever it might be. And some of those feel ancient. Some of those are biological or visible. Some of them are concocted recently, right? When I was a kid, um, I don't feel as strongly about this now, but I was extremely strongly on the Apple side of the Apple-Microsoft fight, mm -hmm. right? And like Apple fanboys were an identity. Like mm -hmm. that, I mean, you, it had all the hallmarks of an identity. And I think, I, I don't know how, I mean, you, you know all this stuff. So, you know, how much you've done the Toshville experiments, but the degree to which people yeah, very right. rapidly create identities mm -hmm. around things that people give them in the moment, I, th that's I think right. is remarkable. Mm -hmm. So. One of the things that I think has been hard for people to to separate in this is the container, like what we say our identities are about, mm -hmm. and then the fact that at some point they're just about our group, mm -hmm. right? That we've we've cordoned around our group, mm -hmm. and now um, what we care about is defending the group's interests and going yes. back to Tumos, Thumos. Thumos. Yes. Um, making sure the group gets recognition. Right. And while Barack Obama is clearly a more personally Christian man mm -hmm. than Donald Trump is. He was not giving at least the the broad Christian right, Christian political mm -hmm. community, a sense of recognition and status. Donald Trump is less Christian but is giving more recognition and status. And I yeah. think in the way a lot of identity politics works, that's natural in a way we don't like to admit. Yeah, I don't know whether the difference is so much in the recognition they're providing as in the concrete political support for outcomes like – who's going to be on the Supreme Court, you know, that, that they really care about. Uh, and that's the sense I, in which I think it really is a fairly cynical exercise on the part of a lot of the Christian right. But, you know, that's something we can argue about. But, you know, I think in, in general, you know, I was asked to write a review of Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations 25 years after the appearance of the article. And one of the things I said was that he believed in culture. You know, he believed that it's there been were 25 these, years since that came yeah, out. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, even longer since the end of history. <laughs> so, um, in fact, I remember that yeah. piece coming out and I'm, I'm you know, not that yeah. old. So he basically said that you've got these deep cultural beliefs usually rooted in, in religion and that's how politics is going to be organized. And I think that actually – that's not quite right, that identity is actually a better way of understanding the way that politics is being organized. And as you say, it is very flexible and it can be organized around small groups or larger groups or something in between. It's socially constructed. And I think that that's kind of the task is that we've gone a fair ways into this splintering ever smaller types of identities. You see this in the progression of, you know, gender pronouns over the last 10 years where all of a sudden there are all these in-between genders that no one have actually ever heard of before but whose, you know, the dignity of the people using them are still things that need to be protected. And I think, you know, that's an understandable process but it does need to be deliberately balanced by efforts to create identities that are more integrative and so – you know, Apple versus Microsoft is one version of it. But I think that national identity as a practical political project is really the level at which you need to think about building these communal values because, frankly, political power is still organized around these things we call, you know, nations. And 
those political institutions aren't going to work unless you have those kinds of integrative identities. That's the problem in the Middle East. Those identities don't exist. You know, and that's why these countries, one after another, has fallen apart over the last decade. And so I think we as Americans need to think about that as well, about you know, what binds us as well as what makes us different. All right. I think this gets us into wonderfully sticky territory on a couple of levels. And I'm trying to decide which way to go first. Let's go here. Who are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Because in everything we just said, everything you were just saying, the actor mm -hmm. is left a little bit vague. Yeah. Like who is deciding which identities are being called forward? Mm -hmm. Who is deciding which conversations we're having? Mm -hmm. One of the things I, I felt was true about your book was it had a little less agency than I think is deserved for – the groups that are actually putting their claims uh, on the agenda themselves. That there's this idea of – the book often talks about the left and the right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I cover the left and the right for a living. And what I mainly believe about them is that the people who journalists used to mean when they talked about the left and the right or very, at the very least Democrats and Republicans have a lot less power over mm -hmm. where their party goes mm -hmm. than I used to believe, certainly. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a, a good example on the left right now is that there is a discussion about um, abolish ICE, mm -hmm. right? Abolish mm -hmm. the, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, and that came from a guy named Sean McElwee, uh, who's a smart guy and a policy analyst and commentator. But he's a guy on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And I am 100 percent sure it is not what Chuck Schumer or Nancy Pelosi or, for that matter, Barack Obama want the party talking yeah. about. But it is what a lot of people are talking about. Mm -hmm. And it's because it got a lot of energy on Twitter and then journalists began mm -hmm. asking about it and the media is interested in it because it's controversial. Mm -hmm. And I see this a lot, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they're much bigger versions of it, right? That's a kind of mild one. But Donald Trump is mm -hmm. not what the Republican Party wanted the country no. talking about. They didn't want him to exist. Mm -hmm. You know, as Democrats have become a much more non-white party from where they were 40, 50 years ago, mm -hmm. the centrality of issues to it, inside the Hispanic coalition or, or the African-American coalition has become more important to the Democratic Party. And so – And donors. And donors for that matter. And so I, I think there often is implicitly this idea – and I hear it when different people talk about identity politics – that it's like the Democratic Party is making this decision or the mm -hmm. Republican Party. But it actually seems to me that as different groups become more powerful, as technology changes and allows mm -hmm. them to make the intensity of their sentiments known, mm -hmm. that that's what's driving a mm -hmm. lot of this. And mm -hmm. so how even if one believed you should be driving back towards a national identity mm – -hmm like anybody would take the steering wheel is, qu is quite unclear. Yeah. Well, there's not a single person that's going to take the steering wheel. I think that it is going to be the product of an internal political struggle. And, you know, it's a pretty important one. I think, you know, right now the Democratic Party faces this big strategic choice, not so much for November uh, 2018, but for 2020 when they have to come unify behind a single candidate, whether they're going to follow a strategy of doubling down on existing identity groups that constitute the party and where all of the party's activists live. And, you know, it's a very attractive electoral strategy because, because the activists really care about these, you know, these very specific issues. You can mobilize people and get them out to vote. Or whether you go for, uh, you try to attempt to get some of those white voters that have defected over the last 30 years from your party to the Republican Party over some of these precisely identity kinds of issues, but also some, you know, policy issues as well. And I think that's a very important choice for that party to make. Now, who makes that choice? No single individual is going to do it, you know. It, it'll come as a result of the clash of these different conceptions of where the party ought to go, and a lot of it will be determined by voters. Right now, I think the primaries we've seen don't give any real indication because they push in both directions simultaneously. But by 2020, there actually is going to have to be a, you know, a single choice made in, in terms of the candidate. So you're right. There's nobody in charge of that process. But there are leaders and there are people that can shape that decision and articulate you know, the pros and cons of the different choices involved. So I, I don't want to take away from the agency of the leaders here because you're clearly right. And actually, I think it's interesting to say that Barack Obama was an unusually talented politician, in my view, at creating a national identity. Mm -hmm. He was better at telling a story about America than mm -hmm. all but very, very few politicians in, in our modern political history. That said, one of the things that I've come to believe is true covering this is that the perception of candidates is heavily influenced by their coalition, oftentimes even more so than by what they say. Mm -hmm. So 
Hillary Clinton in 2008 was running against Barack Obama for the Democratic primary nomination. And when she was doing that, she was considered the candidate of the white working class right. in the Democratic Party. She right. won this overwhelming victory in West Virginia. And, and if you looked at um, polling, you know, Democrats who had high levels of racial resentment really liked Hillary Clinton. Mm-hmm. Eight years later, I mean, she served with Obama in the White House, of course, uh, but she becomes the <laughs> candidate of this multicultural That's rising. Right. And, and obviously, she she makes strategic decisions that are related to that. But by the same token, I, I've often heard people say after the election that Hillary Clinton should have talked about jobs and not mm-hmm. talked so much about you know groups. And And I covered a lot of Hillary Clinton speeches, and we actually even ran an analysis on mm-hmm. the content of speeches. She talked about jobs all the time. Mm-hmm. But what people saw was the Democratic coalition. Mm-hmm. And what they see on the right also is the Republican coalition. One thing that does seem true to me is that as the coalitions become more and more different, which really is happening with demographic mm-hmm. change, as the Democratic coalition becomes less religious, more non-white, as the Republican coalition becomes mm-hmm. more white, more religious, and as that sorting continues to happen, because it wasn't nearly as sorted 50 years ago, that the candidates can do what they want, but they end up taking on the nature of the coalitions. And then because people get them refracted through mm-hmm. a media that covers things in these lenses, often an oppositional media, if you're on the right for a Democrat mm-hmm. or the, you know, the left for a, um, a Republican who is amplifying the parts you are going to find most offensive, a sort of social media that has the same quality, Russian mm-hmm. bots that are telling you about, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, trying to scare you about Black Lives Matter. I think a lot more of this is about the structure of society and our political coalitions than we like to give it credit for. Yeah. Well, you know, this is one of these longstanding structure versus agency kinds of arguments. And there are certainly plenty of structural factors that are pushing us in that direction. I just think that in history, uh, you've had lots of cases where people come out of nowhere and they're political entrepreneurs that just get you know, they intuit that there's a space for moving in a different direction. So, for example, Donald Trump himself, he's managed to shift the entire Republican Party towards protectionism, away from free trade, uh, away from broad, at least in certain parts, support for open immigration. This potentially could have happened at any time over the last 15 years. It it only happened in 2016 because you had this guy that actually had the insight that you could move in this direction successfully and then implemented that. So I, I still think that things are shaped a lot by you know who we end up with as, as these opinion leaders that are actually able to change the narrative uh, that, that the different parties are telling. Let, let me take a little bit more of the structure side of the argument because I do love this uh, discussion. I think Trump, obviously, 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 as an individual, has a tremendous and pronounced effect. But he is a reflection of a structure that was waiting for someone like him. So he's a reflection of a Republican Party that had developed an increasingly white and somewhat afraid base that was not being well catered to by its mm-hmm. national politicians who were trying to get on board with a browning America, right? I mean, you, you go back to 2012 and mm-hmm. the view in the Republican Party is we need to open up to immigration. That's not where the Republican Party base is. And Donald Trump comes along and says, I am, I'm going to build a wall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I got a whole different view of this. And then a little bit on structure. I, I do think Twitter, which allowed Donald Trump to both evade and control in, in certain ways in media and also the breakdown of party control over nominations. I'm always fascinated by the argument in – have you read How Democracies Die? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so their argument, there have often been people like Donald Trump. They bring up Henry Ford and, mm-hmm. and Father Coughlin but say – Look, like back when parties controlled nominations through conventions, they just had no chance. It didn't matter if they had Mm -hmm. an activated 40 percent of the population that couldn't get the nomination. And now you don't have that, right? You have Mm -hmm. a much more small-D democratic approach to nominating. And so certainly you need the right person. But I've come to think of it a little bit like a market. You Mm -hmm. know, if there's a market need for something, a market desire for something, somebody's going to arise. It may not be this, you know, you don't know which year exactly mm-hmm. it'll be, but somebody's mm-hmm. going to come up to serve what is an obvious market. Yeah. So that that's sort of my synthesis of that debate. Well, look, I mean, that's obviously a case, but sometimes people get surprised and, you know, markets are overridden. Sure. Uh, you can override them by changing the institutional rules. And so I think, you know, one of the things that's been going on that's been weakening the hierarchical control of both of the parties is the shift to party primaries where you know, instead of the party leaders picking the candidates, all of a sudden it's a it's an open contest really for the activist voters, you know, that are in the rank and file, you know, the, the party militants 
begin to exercise greater control. And that's why, especially on the Republican side, we've gotten these more extreme candidates. If you change the rules, uh, that might not happen. You know, if we went to a different electoral system like ranked choice voting, uh, you might get really different results. If, you know, the Democrats have tried to insert these superdelegates to try to maintain more elite control over this process, that's a big fight within the party, but it did help in some respects in the 2016 primary. So there are ways in which structure does not become simply determinative of what uh, what the outcomes are. Do you think that, I know this is a little bit of a sidebar, but something that I think is a question that we don't even quite know how to answer is, do you think that we are so caught up in a small d democratic ideology that certain things that were good about gatekeeping mm-hmm. functions have been derided or have been dismissed. I mean, you brought up the Democratic superdelegates. Mm-hmm. And uh, as far as I can tell, they're going to weaken them or have. I'm, I'm not 100% mm-hmm. sure on the state of that. But what always struck me as true is that they could never have done anything anyway. Mm-hmm. That, that they were not in a position, given what we believe about it, what yeah. gives people legitimacy mm-hmm. to do anything. And yet what's strange about it is that We don't then go and get rid of the Electoral College. Mm -hmm. There is somewhere we've come to rest Mm -hmm. where all change has to be in the direction of being more small-D democratic. We Mm -hmm. we don't like anything where elites would have a check on the democratic voice. But on the other hand, we're not that committed to creating a true democracy. Mm -hmm. And so we've ended up in a little bit of a muddle, (laughs) it seems to me. No, it's a terrible place to be. My uh, colleague at Stanford, Bruce Kane, has written on this extensively that – the prevailing drive behind political reform, particularly uh, in the Democratic Party, has always been for more participation, you know, more citizen involvement in decision making at all different levels. And he points out, I think, quite correctly, that this is based on a false presumption about the nature of citizens, that they are interested, that they are informed, or that they are sufficiently motivated or incentivized to inform themselves about these very complex policy issues that you know have to be decided by politicians and the truth of the matter is that most people are not they've got lives that you know are much more important they're raising families they're working so forth and what happens is that when you ostensibly open up the field to greater participation it's not genuine participation of the entire body politic it's greater participation of activists And the activists do not represent the general population. They tend to be much more extreme in their views, both on the right and the left. And so when you opened up, you know, the selection of presidential candidates to popular primaries, if you look at the voting statistics in primaries, I mean, hardly anyone votes in them. And so you get these extreme candidates that are being elected, like Rick Santorum in one of the few primaries he, when he was running, that he won. He was elected by 8% of the total electorate, you know, and, and, and... so it's this illusion of public participation. I, you know, my beef living in California is that we put everything up for public initiative, including these highly complex policy issues. And so every election, you get this little telephone book full of the initiatives that you're expected to vote on. And you're given, you know, two or three single space pages of pro and con this proposition. How many people, you know, I'm a political scientist. I do not have time to read through this telephone book and study and really get below the surface of the arguments and figure who's really in favor of this and who's really against it. So I think there really is a a, a case for representative government where you vote for people that you think broadly represent your ideological view of the world and you let them make these detailed decisions on what, you know, the appropriate tax rate should be or how do we, you know, implement health care reform or so on and so forth. Well, one of the things actually that that's a good bridge to something that I thought was an interesting point in the book. You write, unlike fights over economic resources, identity claims are usually non-negotiable. Rights to social recognition based on race, ethnicity or gender are based on fixed biological characteristics and cannot be traded for other goods or bridged in any way. I, I wanted to get you to talk a little bit more about this idea that that some issues are positive some and and some issues are, are, are zero-sum because I both think it's true what you were describing there and I'm not 100% sure why it is true. Well, I guess the issue is this combination of a fixed characteristic with a dignity claim that you either make the claim or you don't. I mean, so I guess the place where you'd see this most is in these controversies over Confederate statues or what we name buildings, you know, at Yale University and this sort of thing. 
it's really hard to not make those very symbolic contests over identity. So you get rid of Calhoun College. I mean, you know, so there's there's plenty of reasons why that symbolism is important. But you have to name it after somebody else. And that reflects, I think, a lot of the prevailing views on identity at, at that particular moment. That's an example kind of a, of a zero-sum game, whereas it's, if it's the budget for Calhoun College or whatever, then that's something where you can actually negotiate uh, you know, more or less and what do we spend it on and so forth. But so here's what I don't get about this. Because again, I grant that it's true. I see this in politics all the time, that there are, there are certain issues where if what you are arguing for is a compromise that is allowable – within the political coalitions mm-hmm. that the people exist in and certain issues where if you begin talking about compromise, it is not allowable. Mm-hmm. And yet, you know, if we're talking about a healthcare policy and you want more competition and I want more coverage and we come up with some way that, that, that can go both ways, it makes us happier, but neither, neither party feels mm-hmm. like they got everything. Well, if you're renaming Calhoun College – Right. Presumably what you have is some set of coalitions, some of which believe having Calhoun College is offensive Mm because it is um, in my view. But there's a gigantic universe of people to rename Calhoun College after. Mm -hmm. And so it actually doesn't seem to me to to be any really different that you could compromise on who to name it after. And the different coalitions have different things they care about Mm -hmm. and people get different things taken care of in that. Mm -hmm. And yet it doesn't really seem to be the way it works. Uh, No. Uh, And again, I think part of the problem is that those arguments are really dominated by activists that have really strong opinions and they don't want the thing named after some, you know, much more generic figure that will appeal to a broad group of people. They really want to make a statement that, you know, it's a black woman or it's, you know, somebody that really represents a a particular – a marginalized group that hasn't gotten adequate recognition. And I'm not saying that's bad. I mean, maybe that is, you know, completely appropriate and that's an appropriate redress. But what we're arguing about is this zero-sum competition. You know, you got to name it after somebody. And I think in these kinds of dignity contests, it's just harder to, you know, come up with the appropriate compromise, it seems, adequately representative, you know, to a, a majority of the, you know, of the population. But it's also not just the the activists on one side. I mean, I'm always struck by the fact that I don't see a huge number of white Southerners coming forward and saying, you know what, having a bunch of memorials and highways named after people who fought to secede from the country in order to entrench slavery, okay, that that I see how that might make people who would have been enslaved feel mm-hmm. bad. Here are like a list of people we could name these things after that we still feel would honor Southern heritage. I mean, a lot of remarkable human beings have mm-hmm. come out of the American South. It's very zero-sum on all sides. No, that's right. That's right. You you don't see people saying, yeah, let's have a statue to William Faulkner. Exactly. You yeah, know, it's funny. Right. Faulkner was in my head as well. <laughs> like you could. Yeah, you right? could. You could have you a could. list of people who yeah. would – I mean, there are enough Confederate memorials that a lot of different people could have – people represented in them. Yeah. No, that's right. No, I, I'm not saying it's on one side only, I think. Uh, but that's the trouble with these dignity issues. It's it's very symbolic and that symbol usually does represent the views, you know, a very particular view of how to see history and how to see the identity of your country and so forth. And that That's actually a good uh, connection to, to another part of the book that I thought uh, – that, that raised my eyebrows a little bit. You wrote that – On the left, identity politics has sought to undermine the legitimacy of the American national story by emphasizing victimization, insinuating in some cases that racism, gender discrimination, and other forms of systematic exclusion are somehow intrinsic to the country's DNA. Mm -hmm. And I spend a lot of time thinking about this passage because what it made me think was that that sounds like identity politics to me. And and, and let me me explain why. I think it's – clear, or certainly is to me, that racism, gender discrimination, and other forms of systematic exclusion were integral to our country's DNA. I mean, Mm -hmm. we committed mostly genocide against people who were here before America was, and we enslaved African Americans. And that what it seems to me you're saying here is that it's really important to the identity of Americans and to some degree the identity of whiteness to say that's not true. And actually that may be politically correct, right? To create a, a usable political coalition, mm-hmm. you may need to trade to those groups things that are important to their identities so you can have a broader coalition that can attain a governing majority in America. Mm-hmm. 
But I thought it was striking that the claim to offer what seems to me to be a truthful narrative of the American mm-hmm. story that, that includes the people who are hurt or, or enslaved no, by I, it no, I, is framed as identity politics in a way that the opposite is not. No, I don't think that that's a truthful story because, you know, it is true that uh, – and, and actually I spent a whole chapter talking about the way that American identity has evolved from a racially based one that was exclusive – uh, and very hierarchical to one that is civic, that is, you know, much more compatible with a de facto diverse society. No, the, my problem is I don't believe that the story is correct. I mean, it's very one-sided that, of course, uh, yeah, you had genocide against Native Americans, you had slavery, but you also had a progressive history in which you fight a civil war that kills 600,000 Americans, that gets rid of slavery, you have a civil rights movement, you have women and workers progressively introduced into the political system. And so that's why I don't think it's right to say that it's somehow intrinsic. And, you know, there's some writers like ta Nehisi Coates, you know, that, I mean, are, are basically pushing that line that there's really no difference between police violence in Baltimore, you know, today and lynchings and this whole history of racial hierarchy and, and oppression. And I think that, you know, there is a connection, but it also – it downplays the progressive story that actually is really the only hope for America that we actually have changed our institutions. You know, we passed the 14th Amendment and then we made it a reality in terms of – or the 15th Amendment in terms of voting rights. It took 100 years but we succeeded in shifting the basis of power so that African Americans could participate. We shifted the balance of power so that women are a very important part of the political community, right? So. Yeah, you can say that that there was this this intrinsic racism that was an important part. You don't want to gloss that over. You want to teach that to your children. But I think the progressive story is also one that's there and important. And so that's my complaint with some of the identitarians is they don't want to tell that, you know, the redemptive story. They only want to tell the the story about the original sin. So I, I don't want to speak for ta So what I see that project is doing is trying to offer a corrective to a story that has been pulled too far in a way that is distorted where Mm -hmm. we are and why we are. My understanding of a lot of the effort at that kind of revision is not that the story that you're telling is Mm -hmm. false, right? I mean, nobody denies the reality of the civil rights movement or the existence of the 14th Amendment or the fact that slavery was ended or there was a civil war. But we have such a bias, I mean, in this country, probably in every country, but I don't know enough others to, to say, towards telling a story of heroicness, towards telling a story of our uplift and our victory, that it begins to become unclear what's happening in our modern society. And so, you know, it seems to me that a lot of the effort to weave that back into the very complicated story of America, mm-hmm. right? A story that I think is ultimately one of a lot of progress, but nevertheless has a lot of ugliness within it and, and remains so today, is that if you don't do that, then you look around and you say, well, what's happening here today? It's all, you know, if Native Americans mm-hmm. are, are not doing as well as other people in this country, well, it's all their fault, right? Or if, you know, you have a massive racial wealth gap, well, look, America got rid of racism 50, 60 years ago when mm-hmm. Martin Luther King Jr. got Lyndon Johnson to pass the Civil Rights Act. So mm-hmm. there should be no racial wealth gap. And what seems to me to be happening there is an effort to tell a story that helps explain where we are now. But it does seem to me there's a lot of resistance to that. And that that resistance is – it's funny to me that one of those efforts is strikes people as an identity politics effort and the other doesn't. Sort of wherever you fall well, in it. like it, I said, yeah. you know, I think everybody is trying to shape an identity narrative. And so the question is, you know, do you want to emphasize the particular identities that have been victimized or do you want to try to actually shape, you know, the broader identity? And so I'm talking about that latter context, and I think it's actually not a terrible thing that you actually have this bias that may be a little bit historically inaccurate in favor of a kind of optimistic story because I do think that people have to believe that the future can be better than the present. And that doesn't mean in any way glossing over existing inequalities or, you know, not dealing with police violence or, you know, not dealing with, you know, the actual injustices that exist in today's America. But I do think that when you teach children, you know, what it means to be an American, I don't think that bias towards optimism and the progressive story is a bad thing at all because it does tell them that, 
you know, whatever the current problems, you know, we Americans have been able as a people, you know, as a government for the people, by the people, of the people that, you know, that actually can work and it can solve some of the collective problems that we face today. Today's episode of The Ezra Klein Show is sponsored by Pipeline, a new play coming to movie theaters this October for a limited engagement. Lincoln Center Theater's acclaimed staging depicts a mother's hopes for her son and their family's clash with an educational system rigged against him. It was hailed as potent and intensely acted by The New York Times and lauded as a riveting and powerful new drama by NY1. Tickets are available now for October 3, 5, and 7 in select theaters nationwide. For tickets and more information, visit PipelineInCinema.com. That's P-I-P-E-L-I-N-E in cinema.com. Again, pipeline in cinema.com. How do you think about the, the story the country tells about immigration? It, it certainly seems to me that a lot of our current debate is a discomfort with what is in reality a, mm-hmm. a, a sharply rising percentage of America mm-hmm. that is foreign born. We're not quite at record levels, but we will be soon. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think we're at roughly 14 percent now and we were 4 yeah. percent in the 70s, mm-hmm. uh, which was itself a record low, we should say. And in other countries as well, it seems that a lot of the rise of populist rights has to do with immigration. Absolutely, that, That's a tricky space, mm-hmm. it seems to me. Mm-hmm. So I think that uh, it is really important to disaggregate the different sources of opposition to immigration, both here and in Europe. I mean, you're absolutely right that this is the single issue, policy issue, that most drives people to vote for populist politicians. That was certainly key to the rise of Donald Trump and his wing of the Republican Party. Uh, I think, however, that there is this tendency on the left to simply say, well, this is just the result of a demagogic exploitation of people's you know, intrinsic racism and xenophobia. And I do think that there are other grounds for worrying about the current immigration regime that are not simply based on, on these kinds of prejudices. Uh, one of them actually has to do with this question of assimilation, that people worry about whether uh, in the next generation or the ones following that the current immigrants are actually going to be Americanized in the sense of believing that civic American identity story and, and being assimilated to that kind of national identity. I think they also worry about the fact that the process doesn't seem to be under anyone's control. It's not being managed, so a lot of the immigration is illegal. One interesting point of comparison are Canada and Australia. So there are other Anglophone countries that actually have higher levels of foreign-born than we do. So Canada is somewhere in the 20s. You know, Australia is, you know, it's above the 15% that that we've got. And they don't have these right-wing populist anti-immigrant parties. So why is that? Well, part of it is that the nature of the immigrants is different. So they both have skill-based legal immigration systems. And both of them really try to control illegal immigration. Now, Australia gets a lot of criticism for this because they take refugees from the Middle East and put them in Papua New Guinea or Nauru so that they don't actually touch Australian soil. So it's a, you know, there's a real downside to that policy. But politically, the way it's played out is it has not created this huge backlash despite the fact that these countries are really more multicultural than, than we are. And so I think that if you're going to diffuse the opposition to immigration, you've got to be aware that there's these other more legitimate objections that people have. You've got to focus on assimilation, and I think you do have to solve this enforcement problem, which is why I think you know the solution to our problem has been blindingly obvious. It's been on the table for the last 20 years, uh, which is that you need to trade future enforcement of the existing immigration laws, really good, tough enforcement for giving a path to citizenship, not just for the children of recent arrivals, but for everybody that doesn't have a criminal record. You know, you've got to legalize uh, all of the 11, 12 million undocumented immigrants in the country. That's really the only way I think you're going to lance this bubble and, and actually take immigration off the table as this, you know, incredibly partisan emotional issue. So I, let me think about that. I think that's wrong. Um, and Here's why. Because I think if it were right, Marco Rubio would be president. It seems to me that that is the vision of this 
problem of this political debate that a lot of people in politics have mm-hmm. had. Um, I, I think if if you sort of back that up, what you get is something like the Gang of Eight compromise in the Senate, which was had a lot that was built around, I would argue, assimilation, right? You had to learn English. You had to there mm-hmm. was a lot you had to show about how you were integrating into American society to to become mm-hmm. viable for a path to citizenship. Had a huge amount of enforcement in it, right? Mm-hmm. Somebody was going to get control of this process. We were going to do it differently. Early in Obama's presidency, they tried to show what you were saying yeah. to build capital mm-hmm. by creating a record level of deportations every year, Mm -hmm. a a deportation level that we've basically – Donald Trump has not surpassed it for for all the rhetoric. And it didn't seem to diffuse it at all. And and I thought it's been really interesting when Donald Trump came in and said – you know, rather than creating, you can imagine a compromise that did all that and did some merit-based stuff and, you know, had a the same or even a higher level mm-hmm. of immigration coming in. But Donald Trump came in and he said, you know, if you're going to do – I'm happy to do Dreamers, but the cost of Dreamers is fewer legal immigrants coming in. Mm-hmm. And it struck me that that was what was really happening here, that he was willing to trade actually um, people who were here in an unauthorized way yeah. to just cut legal immigration. It just – one of the problems with the immigration debate to me is that it seems to me a lot of people want to make it a positive sum policy problem. When a lot of the core of it is folks don't like so many people coming here. I mean, that's one of the truly zero-sum spaces in politics, right? If people's Mm -hmm. view is that we should not have so many people coming from Central and South America here, then it's hard to to compromise people who don't believe that that's the case. I'm not sure that that's actually the core of the problem. I think the problem actually is that uh, you have this veto over the compromise by groups on both the left and the right. You have this group in the Republican Party that absolutely will not contemplate a path towards citizenship for anybody, not the children, not the parents, uh, and they're just dead set on what they call against amnesty. And then I think on the left, you do have groups that actually really don't care about enforcement. They don't want to spend any money or time or effort in actually devising policies that, you know, despite what Obama did. Uh, you know, you've got important constituencies that are really not interested in this. And because of the failure of IRCA, you know, the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, it was that kind of compromise, better enforcement for legalization. Only the legalization part of it happened. The enforcement part fell apart because there was too much opposition to employer sanctions. And so right now, on the right, a lot of people that remember that will say, well, yeah, I mean, that's the reason we're not going to compromise because we just don't believe that promises of future enforcement are credible and they've got a certain you know historical record that that indicates that and then on the other side you know they have to deal with their own coalition where there's just a complete ideological opposition to any form of legalization and i actually think that the numbers uh, of legal immigrants uh, if you actually went to a skill based uh, system of vetting immigrants I don't think that that part of it is actually going to be that controversial. Although in the cotton bill, it goes down by 50 percent, right? It just seems to me that a lot of these things are being used to – I don't want to say sneak in because it's public, but as a cover for – you just never see people say, hey, let's do merit-based with more enforcement and 20 percent more immigration, right? Which mm-hmm. would actually seem to me to be a totally reasonable approach, mm-hmm. but you never hear it. One of the things about the way you structured the, the political situation there is that – and I think we see this a lot. I actually agree with you in the ideological cut you made there. I think a lot of people on the left don't really care that much about enforcement and and, and certainly on the right are are very skeptical of, of immigrants coming here. But what I often see is that people on the left are willing to compromise on that. Mm-hmm. So across a lot of different bills, coming into and, and continuing in the Trump administration where Representative Gutierrez – was like, look, I will build your wall myself. We will mm-hmm. give you money for the wall to save the dreamers. Mm-hmm. It seems to me that right now the left is more willing to engage in transactional policy compromise than the right. Mm -hmm. So even if sometimes there is symmetry and people having uh, opinions that um, could scotch a deal, Mm -hmm. the left tends to be willing to trade those opinions earlier to make a deal. I'm perfectly willing to accept that that's true. Why do you think that is? (sighs) It's hard to say. I think that somehow the way that the right has evolved in this country – I mean, why did the Tea Party ar- arise in the wake of the, you know, the 2008 crisis? It, that's very hard to understand in general because it should have been a left-wing populist movement that, you know, came out of this Wall Street, you know, crisis born on Wall Street that, you know, really benefited uh, in the long run, you know, the people that were wealthy already. So, 
I think that's part of a larger puzzle in this country as to why, you know, you've had this emergence of a populist right. And again, I think it is largely or very heavily driven by some of these identity concerns that uh, are not going to be completely addressed in, you know, the kinds of legislation, these kinds of compromise pieces of legislation, which may explain why people are still opposed. By the way, in terms of the overall numbers, setting what the right number of legal immigrants is, is actually not that easy a thing to do. And you can actually make the argument that one of the reasons why you had, well, this is a little bit of a historical uh, <laughs> digression, but you know, we cut off legal uh, immigration uh, almost entirely in the Reed-Johnson Act in 1924. It was a racist act because the legal immigrants were based on the, the numbers of different ethnic groups in the population already, so it was heavily biased towards Europeans. My own family suffered from this because the quota for Japanese was only 100 per year, and my mother had come over in 1949 as a student, and when her visa expired, she wasn't in the quota, so she had to go back to Japan. So, you know, it was a very unfair act in many ways. But the only plausible defense I've heard for that restrictionist regime was that that is what allowed the United States to absorb that huge intake of immigrants when the number of foreign-born in the 1920s had gotten up to about 15 percent of the population and then to uh, Americanize them. And so that's when all the Jews and the Italians and the Poles and, you know, all these groups that – had been regarded as, you know, kind of subhuman people when they entered the country at the turn of the 20th century. They all found their place in American society. They began intermarrying with other Americans. And, you know, a lot of those ethnic, older ethnic groups really disappeared as, as distinctive groups. And so I think that if you actually are worried about assimilation, the numbers of legal immigrants is actually something that should be open to debate because you want to take in people at a rate where you actually think that you can uh, assimilate them successfully within a generation or so. And that's a very hard thing to predict. But I, 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 even in that area, I do think that there's there ought to be some room for discussion. Well, what does unsuccessful assimilation mean in the American context? And, and the specific reason I ask is, so I grew up in Irvine, mm -hmm. California. And so Orange County, California mm -hmm. is very heavily Hispanic, very heavily Asian. And there certainly were a large number of first-generation immigrants there. There were communities where a lot of people, although certainly not everybody, didn't speak English. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, it was a very cohesive place, you know, more mm -hmm. or less. Um, it was a place that had a good economy, continues mm -hmm. to have a good economy. Again, you know, there are pockets of exceptions. And it's a place that felt very American to me. You mm -hmm. know, like I grew up there. I feel very American. I have a lot of pride in my country. Yeah. And not just that. In my – the way I understood Americanness there, the people who were – had come here and were working 16 hours a day, six days a week. Yeah, they're more American than native-born American. It, it felt right? very yeah. – I mean when I would be taught in school what mm -hmm. it meant to be American yeah. and I would look around, it felt very American yeah. to me. Mm -hmm. And so – I understand some of the concerns about how assimilation has occurred in Europe, where mm -hmm. it does seem to me that you have more communities that are separated and that have radicalized mm -hmm. and 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 that feel like they're in tension with the broader yeah. society. When I hear it in the American context, I mostly hear people talking about communities like the ones that I grew up in mm -hmm. or near where I grew up, and it just doesn't seem like the horror story that is being suggested. No, I think that's right. I think that the assimilation engine in the United States is still basically functioning. But if you think about how polarized and divided native-born Americans are, in a sense, even what we want newcomers to assimilate to is a little bit uh, unclear. Uh, and it's certainly conceivable that you could shift towards a more European-style growth of parallel communities where you do get these ethnic enclaves which do not assimilate within the second or third generation but continue to, you know, live together, continue to speak their, you know, their separate languages and really have political values that may actually deviate from the kind of liberal principles that, you know, we expect uh, Americans to share. That hasn't happened yet. 
but I don't think it's unreasonable to worry about it uh, happening because I do think that you see a lot of European countries, you know, going uh, uh, in that direction. So I've got um, one more big question for you, and then we'll wrap this up. I know I've taken a, a fair amount of your time today. Your previous two books mm-hmm. were these really remarkable political histories going back to pre, well, pre-modern times, mm-hmm. primitive times. I'm curious what you think is the best analogy of another society for America right now, which you, you people, I think, often reach for the one that is closest at hand, which mm-hmm. are often extremely, let's say, historically dramatic ones. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of you know arguments about whether or not we can compare things to different fascist regimes or, or whatever. Yeah. Given your level of knowledge about different political societies, what what do you look at as a comparison? Well, you know, the the last book I wrote before this identity book was called Political Order and Political Decay, and I. Uh, had a model of political decay that actually transcended cultures and centuries and so forth. And and basically the model is the following, that you have a political system that tries to be modern in the sense of creating a an impersonal state that really treats citizens on a relatively, you know, even-handed basis. It's very difficult to maintain because it's sort of unnatural that we really like to favor friends and families. And what happens is the system first becomes very rigid and hard to change, but then progressively the elites in the society basically entrench themselves. They use their elite position to protect their positions, protect their families. And so, for example, the Han Dynasty in China, which was the first really modern bureaucratic regime, eventually gets captured by a bunch of elite families that that you know take over the system. The Turkish Ottoman system was actually a remarkably modern system of administration. They did not permit the Janissaries or the, you know, these imported slave soldiers that became their administrators and soldiers to have children because they didn't want nepotism. And they kept that at bay for a good long time. But eventually these systems were captured by the elites. Uh, this natural tendency to favor your own took over and the modern characteristics gave way to return to what I call patrimonial government, meaning, you know, it's me and my family forever. And I think that's what I see going on in the United States, is that the elites have succeeded in entrenching themselves through campaign finance, through the merger of economic power and political power in this country. There is, you know, a growing dynastic character to a lot of our politics. And it's so rigid that it's really hard to figure out how to change this. We can't control campaign finance uh, because the Supreme Court tells us, you know, know, that's what's in the Constitution. We can't change the Constitution. We can't get rid of the Electoral College despite the fact that it's producing these anti-democratic results because, again, the system is too rigid. So that's my... (laughs) <laughs> That's my view of you know why it's hard to maintain a modern state, and I think that there are actually plenty of earlier historical examples. You know, the French old regime uh, got into such fiscal trouble in order to cover government budget deficits. Basically, they either printed money or they began to sell offices. They literally sold the office of treasurer of France to a rich guy that could then collect taxes that he could you know spend on his own family in return for essentially a, you know, a payment to the government. And we have uh, things that look uh, un- <laughs> uncomfortably uh, like that in, in contemporary America. Well, a cheerful note to end on. So as always, as you know, we ask for some book recommendations. What are a couple books you'd recommend to better understand how identity politics is operated in America or in other societies? Uh, a couple of them that I was quite struck by is this Aachen and Bartel's book uh, about you know, what they do is they criticize what they call the folk view of democracy, which is that we are all these rational NPR listening voters that have opinions about policy issues and we vote for representatives that will best reflect our policy preferences. And what they say is, no, actually there's a ton of empirical research that says we start out with a partisan preference. We pick the team that we want to be on and whatever policies that team is advocating, we advocate. And there's actually not even retrospective accountability because most voters don't really know enough to actually hold people genuinely accountable. So the economy goes up for reasons that have nothing to do with a particular administration, but they like it. And it goes down, again, for reasons that have nothing to do with actual policies, and we punish it. So the whole idea that you have rational voting and 
rational choices by democratic citizens. Uh, you know, they they punch holes through. The other one that's that that's really democracy is, for realists. I should that say democracy. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's right. That's the name of the book, Democracy for Realists. The other one that is very much in line with that is Jonathan Haidt's book, The Righteous Mind, in which he broadens the scope of view not just to politics but to cognitive activity in general. And it, it's completely in line with that, where he shows that we basically make these moral preferences, and that all of our cognitive, our formidable cognitive powers. Uh, are not used in developing our preferences. They're used in defending pre-existing preferences, which again lines up with the Aachen and Bartels book uh, uh, very much. And I think, you know, it draws on a lot of social psychological literature. And it's very depressing if you actually believe in democracy because it really means that it is this team sport, as you were describing, where you sign up with a team and rationality plays, um, you know, very little role in it. And finally, what is your book and where can people follow your work in the future? So the book is Identity, the Demand for Dignity in the Politics of Resentment. Uh, it's available. It came on sale September 11th. And it is actually a follow-up to the end of history and the last man because all of these themes of thumos, recognition, dignity were issues that I said could challenge democracy way back in 1991 when that first book was published. And in a way, you know, a lot of that is now playing out in, in the world, in the United States, in the world uh, in general. And you're on Twitter, right? I am on Twitter. What is it? Uh, it's Fukuyama, at Fukuyama Francis. All right. Uh, at Fukuyama Francis, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks very much, Ezra. Thank you to Dr. Fukuyama for being here. Thank you to my producer, Jillian Weinberger, my engineer, Griffin Tanner. Ezra Kalancho is a Vox Media podcast production, and we'll be back on Monday 